Mr. Tumusime Richard, how are you? Ah, Mr. Kanzram Shabe, good morning. Tumusime Richard, how are you? Good morning, Mr. Erhanga. Ah, Mr. Kanzram Shabe, good morning. Okay, so I think we will start right away uh, in respect of time and whoever joins us will be joining us and we'll be happy to continue admitting people <clears throat> as we... Okay, um, good morning everybody. Uh, my name is Herbert, as you all know me, uh, or maybe some people don't know me yet. Um, we are starting a series of wildlife discussion, uh, wildlife tourism discussion in our country uh, to make sure that we let people know, make sure that we, uh, people know. We, are, we are doing some work on tourism and we are not doing some work to die or disappear. Uh, I will first request that if you are not talking, please kindly mute yourself. So that other people, I mean, can hear what's going on. We avoid echo in the background. Uh, and of course, if you want to speak, you can raise up your hand. That would be very good. There is always a, an icon somewhere which shows you to raise up your hand and you can be picked up. Um, also, uh, feel free to interact. We shall have three sessions. The first session is uh, this introduction. Uh, the second one will be uh, presentation from one of the guides, and the third one would still be uh, this, uh, from one of the guides. It will be the first one will be looking at the zebras, will be, will be presented by Mark, and the second one will be primates, presented by Davis. These are things that have always confused us in whatever we are doing in our country, in our jobs as guides, and sometimes it's, a, it's part of the challenge that we go through when we are marketing this country or when we are dealing with tourists who come to this country. So you're all welcome to this discussion. I hope it will keep it in time. We shouldn't go beyond two hours, but uh, to bring you to speed, I will begin with, uh, I want to avoid the protocols of introducing people, people because everybody is coming on board and I cannot introduce anybody. I mean, everybody, I will only uh, let people uh, introduce themselves when they are going to speak to be able to keep ourselves in time. I can see all of you are tourism um, stakeholders, but most importantly, we have the, of course, I must announce that we have uh, 
visitor who is joining us, uh, Mr. Bradford, the Deputy CEO of Uganda Tourism Board. Uh, Mr. Bradford, you are welcome. Thank you so much. Thank you. Right, thanks. And we have uh, Mr. Msime from Uganda Wildlife Facility. Mr. Msime, you are welcome. And of course, I'll be introducing to you whoever comes in because we are all men here. So uh, quickly, I want to come to um, a quick presentation, which I have for maybe about five minutes. It won't take long. Uh, it won't take long, and I, I'm sure you'll be able to, to listen in. Now, the discussion that we've started today will be mainly focusing on the challenges of uh, the challenges of uh, wildlife tourism in Uganda. Because all along, been, it's, it's, it's something that uh, this wildlife tourism is what dominates, it shares a bigger percentage of the tourism business in Uganda. I know there is cultural uh, heritage tourism, there are adventure tourism, there are all these things, but we wanted to focus on the, on the wildlife tourism. If it is the one that is, is good, are we doing it very well? Uh, we've been, going out all the time into the national parks. Uh, you know, we, we, we take tours into the national parks all the time, but uh, out there in the national parks, we meet animals. Uh, my computer is running bad here. Um, let me first get something here. Um, we, we meet, we interact with animals all the time. We do our business with, with animals. So we wanted to look at the challenge that we face as we interact with these animals. Um, now, what is, what would we call the wildlife tourism? It's observation of wildlife as, you know, it's, it's observation and interaction of wildlife in a natural environment where animals are found. That's what I have a call here, which I must, I'm in a meeting, see if I'm in the presentation. I'm in the presentation, see So, um, I'm trying to get my computers work very well. Uh, I'm having challenges here. Let me go to exit. Uh, okay, yes. Okay, now I can see it. It's have, I'm having a challenge. Uh, I miss technology, I think, like Tamonia agrees with me. Okay. I got it, it's where it is. I'll go through this side, I think that's better. So uh, quickly, um, it's wildlife tourism refers to the observation and interaction of wildlife in a natural environment, as simple as that. And then uh, how is wildlife tourism done? I wanted to make just a quick, quick introduction. It's not widely researched, it's not a huge topic. I just wanted to pick out a few things focusing on the tourism we do uh, that deals with wildlife. And these uh, examples, we, we, how do we do wildlife tourism? We do uh, to wildlife tourism packages or wildlife tour packages. And these have examples. These examples we have just, someone can say mammoths of Uganda, gorillas of Uganda, birds and gorillas, primates of East Africa, wildlife and culture of Uganda, name it, quite a number of them. People can make all these um, and many, many others as wildlife based packages. Without packages, we cannot get uh, uh, what we want as a sale. We don't make a sale. So, so what do we need to conduct a successful wildlife tour? Of course, we need protected habitats, forest rivers, savannas, gardens. Do we have them? Yes, we have, and many others. Do we have wildlife? Yes, animals, plants, fauna and flora. Do we have them? Yes, we have them. Um, we need updated information. Do we have an updated information all the time that is giving us updates on what we have in stock? That is another question we're going to discuss. The reason we are here is actually mostly hinged on that one. 
What about infrastructure? Do we have roads? Yes. I can drive from here to Moroto without any pothole. I can go to Kisor without pothole. It's the Maliki, the same. Do we have cell phones? Yes. Do we have internet? Yes, we have. But at the moment, it's still shut down, but we're still using it. Uh, maintain trails. Do you have maintained trails? It's a question to discuss also. Campsites, do you have? Yes. Do you have hotels? Yes. Do you have all these things are in place? Do you have license to operators? Yes, you are getting them. Uh, you get towards the bodies actually doing their work. What about licensed or maybe knowledgeable tourist guides? It's another question we're going to talk about today. Some of the challenges of wildlife tourism in Uganda, the ones I picked are these few. Inadequate product knowledge. Where? In politicians. Most of our politicians have no knowledge about wildlife tourism. They have no idea about what is happening where. Uh, I am I'm praying that the next parliament has, I'm praying that the next parliament has uh, a, a members of parliament who understand at least to have some knowledge in tourism because I see some cooperators have become members of parliament. That would be very good. Uh, technocrats, most of them you've interacted with technocrats at all levels, different ministries. You see people talk about tourism, but they have no idea about what it takes to do tourism. Yesterday I was sitting with the people from education, they have no idea about what tourism is all about. And they were examining people, they were giving it, they were, they were examining people, uh, students who are going to work in tourism, awarding them diplomas. I was just like, what is this now in this country? But I hope we shall get to there. The two operators, inadequate knowledge, product knowledge in, in the two operators, hoteliers, marketers, and all these people who do a lot of work. Sometimes someone presents a magazine, and you look at the images of the animals there, you cannot believe they are not even in Uganda, they're not even in East Africa, but they have used as Ugandan wildlife. So we go down to tourist guides. It becomes uh, a disaster when you have a tourist guide who has no idea. You have a photographer who has no idea about it. The other animals, animals they are photographing, and they're sharing images of the things they don't even know. You have got a guide who's going to stay with the tourist for 30 days, 15 days, 18 days. He has no idea about the wildlife. He doesn't understand. Or if they have, it remains, if they have some knowledge, it is inadequate. They have some knowledge of maybe spotting, like say, uh, that's the zebra, like you see that zebra, that's the Equasquaga, but he doesn't even know which one. Now this one, I, I put there the name, uh, the name of the of the of the of the of the, uh, of the race, just to try to show what we have in the country. Maybe somebody who will be Mark, who's going to be discussing zebras will give you the details of these zebras. We found out that we have different zebras. the ones of Kidepo are different from the zebras in in in, in, in Lake Buru. But many people in Uganda, including some of the people you think they really, even the guides in Lake Mburu do not know this because I've been involved with them, I've been getting them, and they don't understand this. So, quickly, that's what I would want to use as an introduction to the main discussion, uh, which, of course, brings me to the next point of inviting uh, the next speaker. Please take it cool. Uh, if you are not speaking, mute. Richard Tomsino, please mute your microphone. Uh, very important that you keep muted so that we don't pick the, the noise in your background. So we we are going to have uh, a presentation from Mark. It's about these confusing animals, the zebras. For a long time, we called the zebras in Uganda as bushes, but it's not what we have. We found out that actually these zebras are not the ones. We've tried to update the information, but of course we're updating it from the private sector. We don't have enough authority to uh, we don't have access to the, the wildlife data bank to be able to make sure that these things we are talking about they are there. But as business people, as, as stakeholders, as Ugandans, we definitely need to make sure that we make a point here and say, look, this is what we have in the country. And therefore, we need to make sure that we uh, do more research and be able to give correct information to the tourists who come here in the publications, help the people who write magazines to write the, give the correct information. So, um, Jeremy, to welcome Mark. I think Mark, you are ready, please. Go ahead with your presentation. Uh, thank you, Mr. Habibiorohanga. Yes, thank you, Mr. Habibiorohanga. Uh, good uh, morning, everybody present. So I have a small presentation about the zebras in Uganda. Yes, the zebra. One of the most, I would say, misrepresented species of mammals within the country. 
So to begin my presentation, I would like us to go through the the etymology of the word zebra. Basically, that is the origin of the word zebra. So the term zebra was derived from a Latin word in the 1600s. The term was equiferous. Equiferous can basically be split into two, equus and ferus, loosely translating to a wild horse. The term equiferous entered the Portuguese language later on as a zebra or zebra, which was a derivative for a vulgar terminology, basically referring to someone as a wild ass or a fool. That's why in the Portuguese then it eventually entered Spanish and English and within the 17th century came to be known as the zebra. But as well, the age, in ancient times, the Greeks also referred to the zebra as hippotigris, which refers to a horse, strike, horse tiger, basically because the zebra looks like a horse and is striped as well. The term hippotigris is now currently used to describe a subgenus of African equids that can easily be identified by distinctive black and white stripes. So uh, I'd like to go to the equus family. That's basically the family of the zebras. The equus family is a, a family for single hooved mammals, basically the odd toed ungulates like the zebras or the horse and relatives alike. There are seven species that fall within the equus family. The zebra presents three different species. That would be the mountain zebra, the plains zebra, and gravy zebra. The wild asses are also three, the kiang, the onega, which is sometimes called the Asian wild ass, and then the African wild ass. Then we have the horse. There is one species of horse, but subdivided into two subspecies. We have the horse and we have Przewalski's horse. <clears throat> so I'd like to talk about the species of zebra. I'd like to expound on that as well. So in the African continent, we have three species of zebra currently. We have the gravy zebra, which is equus gravy. We have the mountain zebra, equus zebra, and the plain zebra, which is currently referred to as equus quagga. And I would like to begin with the gravy zebra. So the zebra you see before you is the gravy zebra. <clears throat> it is a large zebra with very fine black stripes as you saw and very large ears as this current image portrays it is the largest of the zebra species in fact it's the largest equid in the, in the family of equids it is the largest it is basically bigger than a horse it is considered to be the most threatened because of its distribution they are only native in kenya and ethiopia in basically very dry arid areas the gravy zebra was named after Julius Gravy, who was the president of France in the 1880s. His reign was basically between 1879 to 1887. Uh, I'd like to talk about the mountain zebra as well. So the zebra you see before you is the mountain zebra. It is found in the Southern part of Africa. That would be in South Africa. Angola and Namibia. So the mountain zebra is divided into two subspecies, the Cape mountain zebra and Patman's mountain zebra. The mountain zebra is the smallest amongst the zebra species. It has a dewlap. For those who don't know what a dewlap is, a dewlap is, if you look at the neck of the zebra, there is a sort of sagging skin. That is what we refer to as a dewlap makes the mountain zebra distinctive from the others by appearance alone you will talk about how fine the stripes are on the body until it reaches the hind legs where the stripes start to broaden 
The mountain zebra is native to Southwest Angola, Namibia, and South Africa. It acquired its name because of its preferable choice of habitat. Basically, it occurs more frequently in mountainous terrains, especially escarpments with a diversity of grass species. Then I'm going to the plain zebra. The plain zebras are the zebras we have within Uganda. So in Uganda, we have the plains zebras. The plains zebras were formally classified as Bruxelles zebras, but that is, if you're reading literature from 1990, they would refer to the plain zebras as Bruxelles zebra, but with modern technology and reclassification, it was discovered that the Bruxelles zebra is a subspecies of the plains zebra. So the plain zebra is considered least concern in the IUCN checklist because it is widespread across the continent. You can find plain zebras from as high up as Ethiopia all the way down to South Africa. So the plain zebras, distinctively from the other two species, have stripes that run to the belly. The gravies and mountain do not, their stripes stop on the flanks and do not reach the belly, as opposed to the plain zebras where the stripes go all the way through to the belly. And the plain zebra was further subdivided into six acknowledged subspecies. And the subspecies are as follows. We have the mainless zebra, Grant's zebra, zebra Bruchel's zebra, and the quagga. So if you could have your attention, the image to the right of your screen would be the quagga. It is currently extinct. It got extinct in the 1800s. The quagga was reclassified later on as a subspecies of the plain zebra, hence the equus quagga quagga, but it's currently extinct, so it's non-existent. Though, there has been research in South Africa taking place to try and, uh, what they say, reintroduce a lookalike species of the quagga, currently called the Rasis quagga. So the distribution of plain zebra in Uganda as follows, as you could see on the map. So in the Northeast, we have Kidepo stretching all the way down to Pianupe. Then if you come, to the western part of Uganda, there's that small orange area that is Katonga Wildlife Reserve. Then the larger orange marking below that is the Lekumburu area and it stretches down all the way into Rwanda. So zebras in Uganda. So in Uganda, we have the plain zebra, like I told you before, but the plain zebras we have in Uganda are further subdivided into two subspecies. <clears throat> that would be the Grant zebra and the mainless zebra. So the Grant zebra can be found in Lekumburu National Park and Katonga Wildlife Reserve. And the mainless zebra can be found up north in Kidepo Valley National Park and Pian Upe Wildlife Reserve. So in Uganda, you would say they're basically separated by the equator because they do not really have an area where they cross over, they basically one is below the equator and one is above the equator. So the images you see before you are for the Grant's zebra, Equus quagga bohemi, or sometimes referred to as Bones zebra. So as you could see, the zebras have well-defined black and white stripes stretching all the way from the body into the belly. Uh, there's no belly picture before, but if you look at the zebra to your left, if you're keen enough, you can see the lowest stripe basically stretches all the way through the under part of the belly. They have a definitive black stripe on the belly, like one that cuts across sort of like unilaterally. And they have a full grown mane. The hair, on the stretching from the head all the way to the back is what we call the mane. They have a full grown mane, as opposed to the grand, oh, sorry, as opposed to the mane that we're going to see coming up next. So here we have images of the mainless zebra, the ones you find in Kidepo. If you look at the image to your bottom right, in fact, let's start with the bottom left. 
you can see the main is less, right? If you come to the, to the bottom right, the main is even lower. And if you come to the, to the right at the top with the PRP on its back, there is almost no main at all. So for the main, let's brothers, the main, they are born with the main, true? But the main keeps on reducing with edge. Hence the term main is libra. So the one we have to the right top is old. And you could tell that by looking at it keenly. It's really old. Then definitively from the grand zebra, you could tell the differences by looking at the heads. The mainless zebras have really large heads, like proportionately large heads compared to other zebras. And if you look at the image to your left, if you look at the nozzle area, sometimes referred to as the muzzle, it sort of looks bent downwards, more like a donkey's kind of head shape. And then the mainless zebras sometimes, or in some scenarios, you can see them with shadow stripes. By shadow stripes, if you look at the image to your left, those black and clear linings in between the prominent black stripes are called shadow stripes. They're common in a variety of zebras, but with the mainless zebra, they are only via the hind legs or upper thighs in some of them. The grants totally do not have that. So some interesting facts about the zebra. Mm. Zebras are native to Africa. The reason as to why I choose native and not endemic is because there are some zebras not in Africa, but they were all initially from Africa. They were basically transported to other European countries, hence the reasons as to why you can find zebras in the zoo in America and in, the, in Europe as well. Uh, zebras were extirpated from Burundi and Lesotho. The term extirpated basically refers to being non-existent in a particular area. The reason that's why you do not use extinct in this scenario would be that extinct refers to a species being completely non-existent all over the world. Extirpated limits it to a particular region. So in Burundi and Lesotho, currently there are no zebras present. So a group of zebras is referred to as a dazzle or a herd. Zebras also form harems. <clears throat> a harem is basically a group of zebras or a dazzle consisting of one male and a variety of different females. And this is a common practice in the plains and mountain zebras. Uh, males are called stallions, females are called mares. The gestation period is 11 to 13 months. That because it varies from the species. Uh, the mountain zebras, for example, can take about 12 months and the gravies take up to 13, but sometimes there are some scenarios where they take up to 14, but the standard is basically 13. So the young of a zebra are referred to as fowl. And then the term colt is only used to refer to a young male zebra. Because there was a scenario where people would interchange the two or something, but a colt is a young male and a fowl is generally a name for the young of a zebra. The estimated lifespan is 25, though there are cases where they have recorded the zebras living up to 29 years. So Zebras are black with white stripes. Some people argue that they are white with black stripes because white is the dominant color. But the black and white stripes are more or less a coating above the skin. And they carry out different activities. The black, basically, the black stripes absorb heat and the white reflect heat, which helps regulate temperature for the zebra. Uh, the zebras are almost impossible to domesticate in comparison to the other equids like the horses and donkeys, which throughout time have been domesticated by human beings. And when it was tried with the zebras, it was impossible because they are very aggressive. They tend to fight back. So zebras can reach speeds of up to 65 kilometers per hour, but that varies depending on the species because the plain zebra we have do reach about 65 and the gravies is about 64. So for defense and when attacking, zebras bite and kick. They have very strong hind legs and they have a really powerful kick and they bite. Uh, they have sharp incisors, if I should say. Their, their jaws are modified. So the incisors are sharper than the others, which helps them 
when feeding, let's say in the dry season, when the grass is inadequate, you'd find zebras feeding off the back of trees. And the incisors help them pull the back off from the trees. Then zebras sleep for about seven hours in a day. And during the day they can sleep while standing, then at night is where you find them lying down to sleep. Another interesting thing about the zebras is the coat of arms of Botswana. So in Uganda, we have the Uganda cob, but in Botswana, they have the zebras on their coat of arms. The image portrayed is the coat of arms for Botswana. <clears throat> so the zebra species, the exact species they use on the coat of arms is Chapman zebra, Equus paga chapmani. According to my research, it showed that the reason as to why they chose the zebra is because it is politically neutral, as no tribe claims to have it as its totem. And then other literature says it's because the zebras are harmless and humble, which resonates with the people of Botswana. So the particular coat of arms, this particular coat of arms was adopted in 1966, the same year as Botswana receiving its independence, which was on 30th September in the same year. Yes, uh, threats of the zebra. We have lions, leopards, cheetahs, spotted hyenas, brown hyenas, wild dogs. And then in rare cases, fight between stallions. As you can see in the image, they have really aggressive fights and sometimes they are permanent damages, damages caused or bruises. They can receive serious bruises and those would fester become septic, basically creating infections and diseases and eventually leading to the death of said zebra. And there we have lions feeding on a very delicious zebra. Yeah, thank you very much. I'm open to any questions if they are any. Wow, thank you very, very much, Mark, for this detailed, detailed presentation about the zebras. I think we are now, you are helping us to get out of the confusion we have had for a long time, whereby we think that in Uganda we have bushes, zebra, bushes, zebra for a long time when we didn't update ourselves with current information. Uh, I want to suggest that if there is any question, please write it down and then we go to the next presenter so that we deal with questions at one go because we need to be sensitive of time. Uh, and if that is okay with everybody, I uh, will go to Davis, please. Uh, go ahead with the presentation on primates uh, of Uganda. There's a lot of confusion on primates, ladies and gentlemen. We don't know which primate belongs where. Every other time researchers come up with new namings. We don't know. You go to sometimes Uganda left office. They have no idea about what they're talking about. Maybe it's a new thing. They didn't have it. Or maybe somebody did research and did not update them. Uh, he left information somewhere. And you know the tourism office may not give you what you need. Uh, if you go to Uganda Tourism Board, they may not have anything. You've got the ministry, nothing. You come to private sector, we don't know. So we remain there, but people come up with information on, from internet that they have, there's a new monkey here. There is a new monkey in such area. Some of you show my, uh, saw my pictures when I went to uh, Mr. Malik, who is my, my friend Paddy and other people, trying to find out about this, uh, trying to find out about this new primate. So Davis is coming up to talk about this uh, premise. Maybe you can clear the confusion like Mark was clearing the confusion on zebras. Thank you. Go ahead, Debs. Okay, yes. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining and for having me here. My name is Davis and I will be taking you through some of the uh, primates we have in Uganda and then giving more detailed uh, information on some of the new species of monkeys that we have here. Okay, so so if I may share my screen, is everybody seeing this? Yeah. Okay. Go for the screen. Okay, so um, Just a brief on uh, the primates. Uh, I was looking through the website and uh, 
uh, of Uganda Wildlife Authority. They say there are about 20 primates in Uganda, and of these, 13 are in Chevalde Forest National Park, uh, which is known as the primate capital of Uganda. So uh, the chim uh, some of these are the chimpanzees, the gorezas, the red-tailed monkeys, the Uganda manga bee, the lehois, uh, and uh, the lehois monkey, uh, then blue monkey, uh, red-tailed monkey, potos, uh, the red colobus, demidovs, uh, etc., and so many more. So um, if I go through some of the order, uh, the primates were, are divided into two. Uh, we have the new world monkeys, the, then the old world monkeys, apes, and humans. So the new world monkeys are basically descendants of the old world monkeys that left Africa. The old world monkeys were natives of Africa, but then left. Uh, people believe that they... Uh, where they crossed the oceans from uh, by uh, going on debris, maybe on, on, on ships, maybe humans transported them to uh, cross the oceans on ships. Uh, others believe it's on debris, but yes, these monkeys went and crossed over to the new world and conquered it. So they adapted to it and became new world monkeys. So the, under these, we have the marmosets, the tamarins, the squirrel monkeys, uh, capuchins, spider monkeys, howler monkeys. What makes these very special is that they have prehens prehensile tails. Uh, by this, I mean tails that can be used as a limb, as a, a, an organ or an appendage that can be used as a limb to support the, the animal, which is not uh, the case for the old world monkeys. The old world monkeys just have tails that don't really do much. The new world monkeys, on the other hand, use the tails as appendages. They can hang over branches with them. They can stand on the tails. So yeah, they use them as a limb, as an extra limb. So under the old world monkeys, uh, the, the old world monkeys are further subdivided into the baboons, the guenons, the patas monkey, the macaques. The macaques are also uh, sometimes called snow monkeys. Then we also have the colobus, the langus, and then the proboscis monkey. Uh, under apes, of course, we have the bonobos, the gorillas, the chimpanzees, and then humans as well. So that's just a brief uh, breakdown of the primates. I will start maybe with the vavet monkeys. Uh, here's just a small, uh, some small information about them. Uh, in their order. Uh, the, or rather the genus uh, Chlorocebus, they were originally part of the Sarcopithecus uh, genus, but then were, were split from there. So almost all the, all the genus, the, the, any animal that has the genus Chlorocebus came from Sarcopithecus. So these vavet monkeys uh, have a lifespan of about 30 years. They live in troops of about 50 to 10 individuals. The gestation period is about five and a half months. Their diet is primarily herbivorous, but uh, they eat also grasshoppers, termites, and even bad eggs as well. So their predators are leopards, eagles, uh, the python, uh, baboons, and humans. Uh, here by humans, I mean people hunt them for uh, bushmeat and uh, also dis destruction of their, of their environment. So right here is a picture of a velvet monkey. So, the vavet monkey itself was further subdivided into another species. We have the vavet monkey, and then we have the tantalus monkey. The tantalus monkey looks very similar to this vavet monkey, but the difference is it does not have a black tip on the tail. Uh, the tantalus monkey does not have a tip, the black tip on the tail, and it is also uh, the habit, the habitat. It is found in the northern part of the country. So if you were to notice carefully, the velvet monkeys that most guides have been calling in Murchison Falls are not exactly velvet monkeys. They are tantalus monkeys. And then the monkeys in uh, Lake Mburo, in Queen Elizabeth, that we find even, in, even at botanical gardens are 
actually vervet monkeys and not tantalus monkeys. But around um, uh, Lake Victoria, there, there's some bit of hy hybridization that takes place. So you find the tantalus monkeys, they extend further south to around regions of Lake Victoria. So around botanical gardens, you'll find a monkey that is exhibiting characteristics of the tantalus monkey and also exhibiting characteristics of the vervet monkey. So that's the hybrid of the two. You find that it has no black tip on the tail, but the hands and feet are black, which is not a characteristic of the tantalus monkey. The tantalus monkey just has the under, the, the palms are the ones that are black, but the rest of the, uh, the arm is uh, the coat of the, of the animal itself. Okay, uh, then we have the patas monkey. The scientific name is Erythrobus patas. It's a near threatened species, according to IUCN. It's a terrestrial monkey. By this, it's the monkey that has adapted to life on the ground. It's not like other monkeys that spend most of their time in trees. This one spends most of its time on the ground. Uh, the diet is omnivorous, meaning it eats both plants, uh, and insects, uh, some bit of meat as well. So the gestation period is 165 days, uh, lifespan is 20 years, and it is considered the fastest runner amongst the primates at 55 kilometers per hour. Um, most of the other monkeys uh, tend to go below that. Even the gorilla itself is, uh, runs at about 40 kilometers per hour. This runs at 55. So the mating of this patas monkey occurs during the rainy season. And this is a picture of the patas monkey. Uh, we, originally, it was considered to be the only species in its, in its genus, Erythrocebus. Uh, but then we have another monkey that uh, the Blue River uh, patas monkey after that, uh, if you are to notice, the patas monkey we have in Uganda has a white nose. There is a subspecies of the patas monkey that uh, occurs west, uh, in the west of Africa that has a black nose. So those are two different patas monkeys. Uh, then we have the blue monkey. The blue monkey is uh, Sarcopithecus smithis. It is sometimes called the Sykes monkey. Uh, they are arboreal, they have a polygynous mating system. Uh, by polygynous, uh, we mean they, the male is uh, allowed to mate with very many females, but the female can only mate with one male. So uh, the gestation period is five months and they breed throughout the year. They naturally give birth every two years, last one is 21. Uh, you'll find that through most of these monkeys, the lifespan is around, it ranges between 20 to 25. So they also have a philopatric system. By this philopatric system, I mean that these females uh, always go back to their natal groups, which is the, the place where they were born. They always go back. And uh, the, the, by that, yeah, that's the philopatric uh, nature system. Then we also have, okay, so this is the picture of the blue monkey. It does not really look blue. It doesn't have uh, features noticeable that make it called a blue monkey. But apparently, if you look at the face, the, the hairs on the face on the side, at a certain shade, at a certain angle in light, it makes it have that blue color hence the name, but it does not really have that name. The groups are basically, um, they mix with other species. The blue mark is mixed with species like the, if you find it, you can find it in groups of like the red tailed monkeys, you can find it in groups of the uh, red colobus monkeys to, you know, for protection and then to share food and resources. Here it is feeding on a fig tree uh, then we have the olive baboons, which are the largest monkeys uh, we have in Uganda. Uh, the scientific name is Papio Anubis. This is from the, Greek, the Egyptian god uh, called Anubis, 
who, who is depicted by uh, a long nose snout, uh, like a, a dog nose, a dog nose uh, with a head, the head of a dog with that nose, but yes, which is similar to the baboon. So it got the name Pap Papio Anubis. It's also sometimes called the Anubis baboon uh, because of the dog nose muzzle. It lives in groups of 30 to 150, with each having social ranking. The lifespan is about 30. Uh, female dominance is hereditary. Here, uh, a, a female of high social rank, the, the daughter of that female will inherit that title as well. So just like how we have kings and queens here, it's the same with the baboons. So a gestation period is 179 days. Uh, here we have what they're doing, uh, grooming, which is uh, one of the social activities that they have to you know, connect with the, with the group. A group of baboons is a troop. Then we have the Uganda manga bee, which is the Lophosebus ugandae. So this manga bee started off originally as the great cheeked manga bee. But Colin Peter Groves upgraded the population in Uganda to a new species that is in 2007, and it became the Uganda manga bee. How he came to this, he noticed that the, anim the monkeys that we have here in Uganda is actually smaller than the actual, than the central, than the great chick manga bee. So after doing some more research, further details, the genes are found out to be different and hence upgrading it to a species of its own, which is the Uganda manga bee. So it's also now a species in Uganda that we have here. It is a boreal, meaning it can, it's adapted to live in trees. Gestation period is six months, life expectancy is about 22 years. So this is the Uganda manga bee, no longer called the gray cheeked manga bee. Then we have the right tail monkeys, uh, Sarcopithecus ascanias, the gestation, okay, sorry. The hybridization is about, uh, there's some hybridization that happens between this monkey here, the red-tailed monkey, and the blue monkey. If you look at this picture here, this is happening in Tanzania on an island called Gombe Island, where they have a hybrid uh, of the red-tailed and the blue monkey. It looks like this. You can see it has the white nose of the red-tailed monkey, but then it has the facial patterns of a blue monkey. Then we have Lahois monkey, which is the Alocrocebus lo loist. The lifespan is 25. They're sometimes called mountain monkeys because of the, the uh, altitude where they can be found. They sleep in a, what's special about these monkeys is they can sleep in a, sipping, in a sitting position, either by holding a branch or each other. The guest session period is about five months. And this is the Lahois monkey. Can be found in Chivale forest, can be found in Bwindi. Goreza colobus. Here is another special monkey called colobus goreza, sometimes called the mantle goreza. It used to be called the black and white colobus monkey. And the word colobus is a Greek word meaning uh, it's missing a thumb. So it has no opposable thumbs. The gestation period is 158 days. The young of this monkey are born white and then they later on develop the black hair. They are preyed on by chimps, by chimpanzees. So this monkey uh, originally was black and white, but then on further research, the black and white colobus monkey in Rwanda is different from the one we have here. So the one in Rwanda was further uh, subdivided and became the Angola pied uh, colobus or Ang Angola goreza colobus. Then here we have just the goreza colobus or the mantle goreza. So this here is what we have in Uganda, the Goreza colobus. Then we have the chimpanzees, a very famous uh, tracking done in Chivale Forest National Park. The scientific name is Pantroglodytes. Lifespan is about 45 years. We share about 98.7% of the DNA with them. 
it's one of the species that are known to use tools and uh, it should not be confused with the bonobo because the bon the bonobo is very different from what, uh, the chimpanzee by it being called the bonobo when they are born they have a black face meanwhile the chimps when they are born they have a pink face and they slowly develop into the the brown brownish kind of face another thing is bonobos have pink lips while the chimps have brown lips bonobos also are very are small and slender compared to the chimps that are really tall and stocky All right next uh, so these are the chimps here so as you can see the young ones have that pinkish face they're slowly developing out of the pink meanwhile the bonobos will have a black face from birth then we get to the gorillas the scientific name being gorilla beringay beringay uh, which is our one of the two subspecies of the eastern gorilla so the gorillas were divided into two the eastern and western the western were further subdivided into uh, the central and then the west the eastern were subdivided into two and we have one of them which is the gorilla beringay beringay, beringay one of the subspecies of this mountain gorilla. Guest session period is about eight and a half, which is almost similar to human beings. Lifespan is about 50 years. The adult male can eat almost 34 kilograms of its vegetation. Uh, the first group uh, here in Uganda was habituated, that was habituated was the Movaya group. So uh, when you go to track this group, know that you are tracking a, a great group uh, that has stood the test of time. Then our group is headed by a silverback and the young males are called the blackbacks. So over here we have a silverback and then this is a baby. So this is just a video of a group of chimps, a group of gorillas uh, having a meal, uh, dissecting the back. You have to notice the uh, nibbling at the back of this tree here. So they have vegetarian, they hardly eat any meat at all. Okay. So uh, then next we go to the Debraza monkey, the Brazos monkey. The scientific name being Sacopithecus neglectus. It was named after an Italian French explorer called Pierre Paul, uh, I don't know how to pronounce that name, Francis, Camille Sauvignon de Brazza. Now he was also the capital city of Democratic Republic of Congo, which is Brazzaville, was named after him as well. And that was during the French colonization. And after they got independence, they kept it on. So which is one of the, I think, the only countries in Africa that has maintained the name of, of, the ex, of, their, uh, of, of this man here. So it was called Neglectus because of its ability to hide from both predators and humans. It's so silent that you may not even be able to notice it. So it can be seen in Semliki National Park in Uganda. They live up to 22 years. Uh, their breeding season lasts from February to March and their gestation period is about six months. So this is the Debraza monkey. Next we get the golden monkey, which is Sacopithecus canditi. Kand uh, it's considered endangered by IUCN. It, uh, it can only be seen in Gahinga in Uganda, in the bamboo area. The main diet is bamboo, leaves and fruit, but it's an opportunist feeder. So during fruiting days, it will feed more on fruit. And then other days when the scarcity of that, it will go to back to bamboos and leaves. So the lifespan is about 20 years and the gestation is about five months. So this right here is a golden monkey. Then we get to our VIP, I should say, for this discussion. 
which is the Uganda red colobus. So this monkey here is, according to most people, when you go to uh, most of our, our colleagues, when you're out in the field, this, most people still call it the Central African red colobus. It is no longer called the Central African red colobus because the, 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 there's some research that was done and it actually does not share similarities with the Central African red colobus. So the scientific name is Philocobus uh, tephros scales. It's sometimes called an ashy red colobus. It was recognized as a separate species in 2001. And the gestation period is six months. Its main diet is leaves. Then uh, its main predator, uh, mainly the chimpanzee and the crowned eagle. So between this red colobus and the black, uh, the mantle goreza, these, of these two colobus monkeys, the chimps tend to uh, like to feed on this Uganda red colobus because their meat, uh, people believe that their meat sound is more tasty than the, they, uh, when chimps go out hunting, when they decide to add meat to their diet, they tend to follow and use, uh, they tend to follow this red colobus. Why? Apparently because the red colobus is a, an aggressive uh, monkey. It, it will fight for its life. So the belief is that during that, all that uh, anger and fight and whatnot, there is a, a release of hormones that sweetens the meat, uh, as according to some people here that, that claim that that's why they find that the meat is more testier in the red colobus than they do with the black, which is, which for it runs away. It does not stay to fight like the red colobus. So yes, this is the Uganda red colobus, uh, previously called Central African red colobus. Then we get to another species that was discovered, okay, uh, discovered as recently. It's been in Semliki, but silent and moving on uh, through the times called the Semliki red colobus monkey. This is completely different from the Uganda red colobus that it has been put a subspecies of. So this is called Philocobus semlikiensis. It has been historically treated as a subspecies of the Central African red colobus, but taxonomy is treated as a separate species recently. Uh, groves in 2001 and 2005 had it as a subspecies of the Central African red colobus, but later in 2007, reclassified it as a species of its own. It's considered to be a Semliki endemic, meaning can only be found in Semliki National Park. There is a species that looks similar to it in uh, Congo. Uh, it's called Kangani red colobus, but that is different from this Semliki. So Semliki red colobus is only found in Semliki National Park, nowhere else. Uh, in, in the world. Um, according to the Global Wildlife Conservation, the Semliki red colobus was lost almost as soon as it was discovered. So it was first described in 1991 and has not been seen in 29 years. So you can imagine how, uh, how long it has been since this uh, monkey wa uh, was discovered. So it was first put on my radar about, I think last year by the, the ranger at Semniki that there's this monkey here that is not really part of the species. It's not really a Uganda red colobus, but a species of its own. So on further research, uh, we discovered that it's actually is a species of its own and can only be seen in Semniki National Park. So this is one, a plus for Uganda that we have two new species that can only be seen in Uganda. So yes, this right here is the Semliki red colobus. If you're to notice, you'll see that even the fur is different from the red colobus monkey, the Uganda red colobus, which you see the Uganda red colobus only has a red or maroon fur crown, while it has the black patches with white or grayish fur on the arms. Meanwhile, this has all red, an all red head with red arm. The fur is red. So here's a video for you to just uh, 
look at and uh, understand what this monkey actually looks like. So yes, uh, these videos were recorded recently uh, when Hubbard and a colleague from Uganda Wildlife Authority went on to Semliki to get this, this monkey. I saw it for my first time last year in 2019, but the pictures I had were not clear. So I'm happy that we have at least this very clear video for us to get a proper classification and maybe help the researchers to get more details about this monkey. Right, so that is what I had. Uh, thank you so much for listening. And yeah, if you have any questions, I'll be ready to answer. Well, uh, thank you very much, Davis, for that uh, detailed talk on the primates of Uganda. Uh, it's actually opens many people's eyes, including me has been going to this forest for all these years and probably have not been paying attention to some of the details. Uh, it's very, very important that even people who uh, present information to other people, the marketers, the researchers, the conservationists have got proper information that we can always share the country and be able to give out the correct information. So time for questions is now. Uh, you are welcome, Mr. Zuma. Zuma for joining us, although you joined us a little late, but you will catch up as people ask questions now. Uh, Mr. Kanzira, your hand is up. Please go ahead and ask your question. Kanzira? Thank you, sir. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, good morning, everyone that has been able to join. My concern is uh, on two things. To begin with, I thank the presenters for the wonderful job they did. But my first concern goes to Davis about the blue monkeys. I just need to seek clarification on the philopathical systems. They, I didn't understand you well when you talked of monkeys always go back to where they came from. You are not very clear to me. So I seek to learn more about that. Another thing you talked about the, when you were talking about the, the Uganda red colbus, you said some people find their meat to, to be testier as a result of fighting. I also need to seek more clarification on that. Thank you very much. Okay, I think uh, Divs can go ahead and answer that one quickly. Okay, uh, so what I meant by the philopatric uh, social systems, I meant that uh, the females, uh, you know, in a, in, in a, in a group, the females, the group they are born into, they tend to stay in that group while the males live after. When they reach adulthood, the males will leave. Meanwhile, the females will stay, they will not leave. So it, the, it, at the end of the day, it usually consists, the whole group usually consists of just one male and then several males. So yeah, that's what I meant by philopatric uh, social systems. It's a tendency of an organism to stay in an habitat or to return to a particular area. So uh, then uh, for your second query, it is a, I would say it's not an actual fact. It is more of a talk that people have had that they believe that this, there are some hormones that are released when you're in a state of uh, fright or flight. During that state of fright or flight, there are some hormones that are released that tend to sweeten the meat, hence them preferring the red colobus to the uh, to the uh, mantle gorilla, which are not aggressive, which don't fight. For them, they run away. These will stay and fight. I don't know if that helps to answer your question. I'm still confused by the prefix "they." Are they humans or 
other primates. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Pardon? I'm still confused by the prefix who. You said them. I don't understand who them relate to. Do you relate to other primates that do play on the red colbus or humans? No, I'm talking about the chimpanzees only when they are hunting the red colobus. Oh, thank yeah. you. Okay, let's get to uh, Richard Tumsima and then we'll get to Bradford. Richard Tumsima, please go ahead with your question. Richard Tumsime. Okay, Richard is not coming on board. Um, let's he get a question from uh, Mr. Bradford. Uh, thank you, moderator. Thank you, uh, Mark. Thank you, Davis. I think uh, this was a very opening presentation, really. Uh, I think from my point of view, uh, as Bradford, uh, really, really quite enriching and uh, we can never stop learning, which is really good. Yeah, from the marketing point of view, of course, we as a country, yes, we need to see uh, products that are marketable, products that are sustainable, products that are, that are available. Uh, of course, as, as UTB now, uh, what do we tell them that uh, we have zebras? Yes. How do we compare with our comparators? Uh, I thought we would need to have the population of zebras in the world if they are there at all. And then as, as a country, Uganda, what proportion of these zebras do we do we, do we account for? Yeah. Uh, sustainable issues like uh, the Kidepo, the uh, Lake Mburu, the current capacities, sometimes when you see uh, from a layman point of view, they, they look too many, Lake Mburu. What is the current capacity? Is it uh, sustainable that we have them, or are they going to disseminate other, just away other animals? Yeah? We need to have, to have that, and the, the same for, 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 for primates as well. So this kind of information would be good for us. And then the, and the, and where do we get the, the information? Where is it available? So I think uh, moving forward, we need to see. Of course, some are borders of uh, scientific uh, information uh, that when I can understand. But what is available, what is proven, maybe that could be shared, and then so that we see exactly. Now, moderator, I also request that for uh, team who are here, who we'll just put their names, uh, the institution they are from, and then the telephone contact, so that when we get out. You can copy a few of those contacts and you know, part of the information we also go again with some uh, contacts that eventually if we need to follow up, we can actually uh, you know, refer to. Thank you so much. Thank you, Bradford. Uh, we will make sure we get to the contacts of these people. I think we know most of them and um, we share with them. These are people from the tourism business. Uh, these are the stakeholders, you actually are stakeholders that do a lot of work in the tourism. So uh, we don't have anybody far from far. They are all colleagues from around. So thank you very much, Bradford. I hope you will get back later when we are closing this uh, session. Uh, let's have Tumsima Richard, please go ahead and say, i ask your question. Uh, good morning. Good morning again. Good morning. I'm online. Yes. Um, I want to thank uh, our presenters, uh, both the, uh, Davis and the, the second one, who, uh, also presented about the uh, zebras. Um, my is a contribution or observation about the uh, the colobus that is uh, existing in Semliki. Uh, I had the chance of working in Semliki for some good years at least. And the, uh, when I joined in 1995, we would see uh, the very colobus they are talking about, uh, the Semliki. And the, in between there, uh, there was the ADF war. ADF war, when it came, of course, you know, like uh, one of the factors that can make someone exist or survive, one, uh, maybe there are several of them, food, uh, security. 
because if there is no security, uh, there is no one who can say, can smile or do whatever. So when uh, the walk uh, came in Semli KDF, these uh, animals, of course, they would come all the way from um, uh, from River Semliki. We had the trails that would run from uh, the main road or near Sempaya, near Kirumia. We would see some of these ones. But of course, when the Edif came in, uh, they tend to disappear. You know, like they disappeared because one, there was no safety for them. And it's good again, like it is quiet in between now when the Edif was wiped out. Uh, these animals uh, are getting back to uh, because uh, the food also contributing uh, to the existence. Uh, there's one uh, monkey, I don't know, uh, uh, the presenter, maybe the one who's doing research, uh, who presented about the Mliki National Park. The Mona monkey, uh, it is not on your presentation. Maybe you can uh, look for the information there. Maybe next time you share with us. Uh, which is found maybe uh, major it is common uh, along river semliki the mona monkey uh, my question is not all that question per se but i can say uh, maybe i can ask it can he, blue monkeys and the red 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 tailed monkeys uh, uh, meet or can they interbreed um Otherwise, because sometimes you fear, you find that they, they they say some kind of you know voices, you know, like it's calls are similar. When you are in inside the forest, uh, the the few times I I spent in Kivali National Park, you hear the same calls, you know, like and only to see it is the blue monkey. Then you hear some uh, another call. When you look, uh, this is red colobus. Uh, do they interbreed or not? Otherwise, thank you very much for the presentations. I salute you all and all your participants. We look forward to, to meet again physically. Maybe you can have to share much about what you have in this country. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Bwana Richard. Uh, of course, the, key, the presenter made, uh, made it clear that is kind of hybridization in Tanzania cases and probably could have be happening in Uganda as well. Uh, let's take a second, another person, and then we go ahead and uh, ask Davis to respond. Um, Dixon, you had a question, your hand was up. Dixon? Yes, uh, good morning, Mr. Hubbard. So uh, I will shoot the elector, uh, as I'm seeing, my, my, my fire is trying to get down his battery, so I will shoot the elector. Uh, Actually, one is a suggestion. I was, uh, Davis had a very wonderful presentation and we're hoping maybe uh, if he is in position to share some of, you know, some of his notes and then maybe uh, we can go ahead and read more about it and, you know, enrich ourselves. So I think that would be very great. And thank you very much, Davis. Uh, the other one is about uh, the general primates, you know, of Uganda. Uh, I've had uh, who are many, uh, who are as in, Ua and even not only Ua, but also Uganda as a country say that Uganda is the primate capital of the world, especially referring to Chiva saying that it is the only place in the world where you can find many primates, about 13 of them in one position. However, I'm, in my recent research, as, as, as I was going you know, ahead to read about other places and other destinations, especially within East Africa, I also found out that there was some information that uh, Nyungwe Forest from Rwanda also has 13 species of primates. And uh, I was a bit disturbed, I was like, okay, uh, is, are we only trying to market, but you know, are there other places that have perhaps even more primates than we think? So maybe it would not entirely be uh, for, for David, so maybe someone else, maybe the members who has any other information about, you know, the general population of, you know, a destination that has more primates than more than 13, uh, perhaps maybe would would enlighten us about that. Other, thank you very much. It has been a very fruitful discussion. We look forward to more discussions. Thank you very much, Abel. Yes, thank you, Dixon. I am also going to say we have got 13, 13 primates in, in Rototo. So it's, I think the figure 13 is what is concerning people. But now it is no longer 13 because Kiba the conservation, I don't know how the, it's one, one of them, maybe somebody from work can clarify on that. Kibare and Semriki, they are now under one uh, management. 
therefore, this, I think when they talk of, I don't know how they would make it, but it should be, we now have more than 13, because if you look at the, the Uganda manga B, they have got the, they have got the new one, the colobus, these two colobus monkeys, uh, they may be, be adding on a new new species. Like Richard said, the dentist monkey, of course, is there, that's Mona monkey. Uh, of course, Davis was just give, touching on other species, but he wanted to focus on the colobus monkey, the red, the red colobus monkeys. The other species was just jumping on them. Again, to go into the details of those other monkeys was just making uh, highlights on them. So it's uh, very interesting that, you know, as we mo give more information, of course, you create some, some kind of competition. Some countries would want to compete, which is very healthy. But what we have to do for our guides is to make sure that the people in Uganda, the guides, the two operators, the Uganda, all of us, that we make sure we get the right information about what we have in our stock so that we are able to stand with it and be able to uh, attract people uh, and make a very nice story for our destination. Debs, do you want to respond? Uh, yes, to so, if I may ask, uh, maybe for uh, if you can pardon me, what was the question again? Okay, so you could have lost it. They were talking about the 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 Richard was asking if the blue monkeys, uh, I mean the red-tailed monkeys, uh, met with the blue monkeys. I think something like that. But you yeah, had answered yeah. it earlier in your presentation, and also. Uh, Dixon was wondering <laughs> why you, they say in the other country they have 13 species in Nyungwe and we also have 13 in Kibale. Is this a marketing gimmick? Is it what? And I tried to explain that you see, people try to find out what we do so that they can get more information. So, um, yeah. of course, can that I? is answered. You want to go ahead? You want to say something? Yeah. Quickly do. Yeah. Um, so. I think the 13 primates uh, is more of like a marketing gimmick, just like we have tree climbing lions in Ishasha. So yet all cats do climb, even the ones in Maction Falls climb trees, but uh, it's a marketing gimmick, I would say. And then also, uh, maybe if I can reshare my screen, this is uh, for Richard's benefit. This is the hybrid between the red-tailed and the blue monkey. This is what the hybrid looks like. It looks more like a golden monkey, which isn't a golden monkey. It has that white nose for the red-tailed monkey. And then uh, the fur is more of a, uh, the blue monkey. So yes, this is the hybrid between the red-tailed and the blue monkey. OK, so thank you very much with that one. Um, of course, in the next uh, discussion, we will definitely task some of the guys to come up with more, uh, more detailed uh, information. Of course, it is in the interest of uh, Bradford and uh, people from Uganda Tourism Board. As we go into the area of licensing, uh, we need to start engaging our guys to make sure that they practice and maybe demonstrate um, the levels of the knowledge they have to be able to uh, guide uh, the sector with correct information. It's a very good culture also to be discussing the things that we know what we have in stock. Martin Gabrano is coming up with a question. Please, Martin, go ahead. Uh, thank you so much, Herbert, and the, and the team of presenters who have made the, some very fantastic uh, presentation. Mine is just something, it's a small comment. Uh, it's like, uh, this one maybe goes to out to the guides community because the guides community is a, a group of people who interact with the, the so many questions and who need this kind of information. So I was suggesting maybe if there could be a way how we can put up like a, like a, a, a center of excellence for primates. Because in this country, we are so blessed to be having primates that we need to have a, a, a place like for the guides where at least everybody can know that this is a resource where guides can always fall back to and uh, which we should feel proud of because it is us, the guides, that meet these questions and it is us, the guides, that should feel proud first to be at the front line to be able to, to, to provide such kind of concrete information. Thank you very much. 
Yes, that's a very great, uh, very great idea. This is definitely something we need to think about and see how we're going to put all these studies for. But there is one already in Chivale, Kanyawara. They do uh, a lot of research, but it's not specifically for the monkeys. But uh, it's something maybe we can front po uh, put uh, forward. Uh, maybe when Bradford is discussing with the ministry in the, in the meeting, sometimes you can really bring it up as a, an idea that is coming from the private sector. We need to cut out all these things to know that if we want information on primates, we need to go to a specific area. We want information about snakes, we go to here. We want information about birds, we know where to go. So that it's, you know, information is shared and everybody uh, knows what is going, what is taking place. You can imagine all of these species of primates that we have in the country. And you have uh, this guide who is traveling with tourists and he has no idea about how many species of the primates are in the country. What's the difference? The difference, the detailed aspects of these different monkeys to know that this monkey looks like this, this monkey looks like you have a red-tailed monkey, sorry, red colobus monkey in Kivale, and you have got another one which is Semliki, endemic, it's just in the Semliki forest. And someone cannot describe uh, the differences. It's a very big challenge. And of course, the onus is on us, the, the tour guides, the tour operators, and the Ghana Tourism Board that we're in charge of quality assurance of our people to make sure that the information given is very, very relevant and uh, valid. Uh, Councillor has a question, please go ahead. And welcome, uh, uh, let me first welcome the uh, Joan Cantu, which team I think, Honorable from Toro. You are welcome, Madam. Thank you, Herbert. Uh, here's uh, an, open, an open question to the house, not necessarily people that presented to us. It's about the, the two coal bus monkeys. Hold a second. The, the mantled Gwezera, sorry about that. The mantled Gwezera and then the Rwandan Angola coal bus. I wonder if any of us here has more information about it, maybe the differences about them, or should we think that the one in Rwanda is maybe an endemic to Rwanda and Angola? Because when you go to Rwanda, you find it has a very higher fee when you go to track monkeys of which they call Kolobe, which is by layman's eye, it looks more like the, the mantle where Whereas that we have here. So I wonder if any one of us has more, more information about it, maybe I need to learn. Thank you. Yes, Alex. Um, maybe if I can uh, Let's go help ahead. Uh, yeah, if I can maybe help a bit. The mantle girls uh, and the you see the mantle girls that has that the white cheek and uh, the, the, the white the face is basically covered all around with white, which yeah. is not the case with the which is not the case with the Angola pied. The Angola pied does not have that white the white chin does not have the white cheeks. It's basically it has a black. And then this has uh, mantles, you know, the, the mantles are those white, the white hairs that go run along the side of the monkey, which is for the mantle gorilla, hence the name mantle gorilla, because the white hairs go across the sides, which is a mantle. Uh, while for the, the Angola colobus does not have that, it, it has hairs that start from the face. It goes from the sides of the face or even the shoulders. It does not really go across the mantle. It just starts from like the shoulders. The, the white hair starts from like the shoulders. It does not necessarily go across the mantle of the, of the monkey. Those are some of the differences you can look out for. Are there any proven genetic differences recorded? Um, and yeah. the information I got from was from the, uh, the, the kingdom field guide to African mammals. I also checked a bit online at some of the, I looked at some of the pictures of the Angola, Angola colobus. And yeah, they definitely look very different from the pied that we see. 
That All is right. on the screen. If you see on the screen, that is the Angola. It's totally different from the one we have in the country. The, yeah. the, you look at the face, look at the white um, and the, 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 the far, how it comes out. It's totally different from the uh, Gwereza, the mantled Gwereza that we have here. Okay. okay. Um, yeah. uh, I think if you're used to our monkeys, you can see that this is totally different. Sure. I can later get the other one as well and probably show you um, the difference this one has. Um, I think I had it for you. I can just quickly uh, show you that one as well. Um, just a second. I get it here very fast. Do if you got that one, look at this. Is how it looks like? Yes, I do. Yeah, that's you now you can see the difference. Just from right. the morphological views, you can see uh, the differences in the these monkeys. So um of course. Um, if there are any, no more questions, you to be requested to put your uh, emails on the chat room, for example. Please go in the chat and put your details, your information, your emails. And uh, I want to say that we will continue, we will continue um, making these presentations, which are internal. Oh, Judith has the question. Judith, come ahead. Please come ahead. Your hand is up, Judith. Go ahead. Question or contribution? Um, question. I, I put up two questions in the chat, but I think um, they've not been addressed. So the first one uh, is to Mark. Um, first of all, Mark and Davis, thank you for the presentations. They were enlightening. So my questions are, the first one is to Mark. Mark mentioned threats to the zebra. And, uh, um, they are basically predators or what the zebra encounters in its natural ecosystem. Okay, yes, there are still threats, but um, is there, um, could you look at, mention the wider scope in Uganda as zebras hunted by people for food? Um, is there any habitat loss threatening and uh, maybe um, illegal trade or I don't know? And the second question is to Davis. Um, so looking at the red colobus, the Ugandan red and the semiliki, they are almost similar. Is, it, is there a possibility of them interbreeding? And also, is there an overlap of habitat in any of the countries? Could you find the Ugandan red colobus and semiliki? If at all, they don't overlap the habitats. Are their habitats different by Altitude uh, very different by uh, by the makeup of the species of trees. Um, yeah, so those are the few questions I've raised that were not attended to. Thank you so much. Yes, uh, Judith, we are not hearing you very well, but I think uh, maybe Mark was able to pick you up your concerns and is going to respond quickly. Uh, then uh, Davis will come in. Mark, come on this challenge. Other challenges with the other threats. Uh, Okay, uh, thank you, Judith. Um, other threats, you could talk about species loss, habitat loss, humans on top of predators as well. By species loss, I am basically referring to interbreeding. Since zebras are closely related and they basically live within similar habitats, basically the chillest grasslands and savannah, savannah woodlands, you could check, you could take South Africa for, as an example, the plain zebras or car in a wide variety of the grants, you have uh, quashes and uh, brushels. So different subspecies would interbreed and that continued process could lead to the entire loss of the species. There is, um, a humans also hunt zebras for the skins because they have like really decorative skins. Then there's also farming and ranching as is the case in South Africa again. I do. I'll use South Africa as an example. There's a lot of ranching that's right there. So zebras are taken out of the wild and treated as domestic animals. So once they lose that touch with the wild, you do not count them as a wild species anymore. So that could lead to the extinction of the extinct, I mean, sorry, of wild zebras actually being in existence. Then there are also a variety of diseases that affect zebras. 
then by um, water. Zebras, it's only the gravy zebra that can last about seven days without taking water. The others, especially the plains zebra, need to have adequate water supply, hence the reason as to why they stay about five to 10 kilometers away, close to a water source are never really moving that far away because they constantly need to have water. So if you count global warming into effect, that will also affect them because they'll have to end up migrating to different areas to find water, as is the case for the zebras in Botswana. When the Okavanga Delta dries up, they have to migrate to different areas. And yeah. If I could. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Mark, for, for that. Uh, Debs, please go ahead with your um, response to Judith's concern, please. Okay. Yes. So, Judith, the. I wouldn't necessarily call them the same species, uh, but I think the, they, do, they do not overlap uh, because of uh, altitude, I would say altitude, because Samliki, as, we, as, we, as you know, it's a lowland forest and Chivale is way up there. It's at about 1,500 meters above sea level, while Samliki is close to like 600 meters above sea level. So. I would maybe uh, put it at habitat and then the food, because I'm sure the, the trees in Semliki where this monkey is, the Semliki red colobus, because it's not in the whole of Semliki National Park. No, it's, it's in a specific area of this, uh, the ironwood trees. That's where you find the Semliki red colobus. So I think that is um, one of the features that distinguish between the two. There may not be a chance of uh, interbreeding then also the classifications of these monkeys has been uh, a bit of a confused, confusing stage, uh, so, or rather process from, for, uh, uh, across time. You find that the, the Uganda red colobus was originally uh, considered to be a subspecies of the Central African red colobus. But then when they look at the other species of the Central African red, they completely do not look at all like this, the red colobus that's claimed to be. So then it is considered to be a species of its own. Then later on, it's again, ch they changed the classification and put it under the, the Tana River red colobus, which looks almost similar to the red colobus that we have here. But then after that, again, it becomes a new species of its own, which was in 2007. Uh, so it became now a species on its own as a Uganda red colobus. It, it's not compared to the other species. Then for the Semliki red, um, maybe if I can uh, share uh, something here from, yes, from here, from uh, the internet. The, if you look at this picture here, this is a, presumably, it is a Central African red colobus. So you can imagine why the Semliki red colobus was considered to be a subspecies of this before, because it has this red fur, the red head, and then the red body. But as you can see, this is just all red, which is not the case for us, the Semliki red colobus. The Semliki red colobus has just the red arms and a red, the red facial hairs around, but behind here is all black. And then this is also uh, black feet here. The, the hind legs are black as well, which is not the case for the others. So the Semliki red was also considered to be uh, a subspecies here. As you can see, uh, there's this link here that goes uh, where they were searching, the global wildlife, where, where I got this picture from, they were searching for this monkey here. And as you can see, this is, uh, the Semliki red, it was not yet discovered. As you can see here, this is what it looks like. All red with just the arms and then the feet. So yeah, this is now what the monkey is supposed to look like. It was a lost monkey, but now we're, we're starting to get uh, people who can take pictures and, you know, and have this sighting recorded officially. And we can maybe help researchers to make sure that this monkey is actually now uh, put on the list as the species of Uganda. Thank you. I don't know if that helps answer your question. Okay, thank you very much, Davis. Uh, that is also another good detail. Well, they're very good uh, 
uh, interesting uh, points coming out here. You know, the whole thing is we are now attracting the researchers to go deeper and find out and give us scientific explanations so that we start, you know, talking firmly with all the confidence that what we have here is really um, researched on and we have correct information. So let's give our colleague David Bakene, the man known to be a guru of the of the rhinos. Mr. David Bakene, your hand is up. Please come along and uh, give your question or contribution. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Comrade Herbert Yerhanga, for the opportunity. Uh, I want to thank everyone who has uh, contributed. Um, like you say, my name is David Bakene. I'm actually currently the ranch manager at the Dua Rhino Sanctuary. And one of my tasks um, that's ahead of uh, the work I'm going to be doing here is to diversify on the products, uh, activities, attractions uh, at the sanctuary. And um, this partially include uh, stocking the sanctuary. So from this uh, discussion, I have already uh, identified which zebras that belong uh, in this region that my focus will be on to bring to the sanctuary. Um, so the discussion was really on point and I learned a lot. Glad to see that actually, even what we used to call a velvet monkey is not a velvet monkey. The learning never, uh, never stops me. So um, my concern is about the increasing number of zebras in the country. Um, I, I love um, uh, the Kimburo National Park, uh, in the numbers, uh, increase. And um, in fact, if I'm looking at the statistics that I have, uh, the numbers have increased from um, 2,430 Ziglars in 1995 to about 5,968 Ziglars in 2006. This is about maybe 6,000 Ziglars in the community. And yet, on average, the park has always had an average of 3,000 Ziglars. Now, if the park itself is the same size, the size has never increased, and yet the number of our animals, our precious zebras, is going up. What happens and which plans do we have as a concerned conservationist to make sure that the number um, uh, matches with the habit that we have? Is it about the time we should start encouraging people around the rural area to start game ranching? Um, is it the time that we should start asking the government to give up some of the ranches, like the Shara ranches, which are government uh, facilities, so that we can expand tomorrow. Is it about the time that we bring in, um, that we lobby uh, and bring in uh, predators such as lions to the park, so that we don't have a huge population, um, and then we start to see uh, zebras just collapsing and dying because the park cannot hold them anymore? Thank you for the discussion. David, congratulations! I didn't know you are the branch manager. You can't. You 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 got things that you are not announcing. You are your achievements, you man. You should have told us, and we start booking through you, man. Yes, congratulations, and you deserve it because you demonstrated all along a lot of knowledge about the rhinos. I'm happy that you you are now the new manager there. Uh, well, of course, I would really definitely want to see more lions coming into the area of Lake Mburu to reduce the number of of zebras there really, it's, 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 it's amazing the, the increase on the number of uh, zebras that we have. But of course we have to be very, very careful uh, because once a species is, uh, is, is finished, is gone, uh, getting it back is a, is a challenge. Maybe the conservationists, including you and other people will put in more energy to make sure that we uh, mitigate this uh, uh, challenge. Mark, do you have anything to add on? On this one is on uh, David's, David's uh, submission. Uh, yes, uh, a, a couple of a while, a, a couple of years back, not really sure when, but within the past five years, there was there was translocating of zebras from Lekumburo to Katonga Wildlife Reserve. The whole ideology was to reduce on the numbers of zebras within the park because there are not enough sufficient predators within the park to the number of zebras on the population of zebras the only negative with translocation would be creating a scenario whereby the species can interbreed with something else there you create 
a new hybrid that's killing the old species. So if I was planning on regulating the number of zebras within Lekumburu, they would have to translocate the zebras to areas where the mainless zebra does not occur. That would be all, but yeah. Okay, I agree with you. They did it in Southern Africa and there was a big problem actually. That mes message is even on the map all of the uh, uh, mammals of, of, of Africa. They made a mistake of putting different species into the same habitat and they crossbred and they lost the original genes of the species, which is very, very dangerous to conservation. So in fact, I remember there was a discussion, they wanted to transfer uh, zebras from uh, Lake Mburo to Pian Upe and Kidepo, but I think somewhere, somehow they got, they discovered uh, they were going to make uh, the worst mistake ever. But now, good thing that they didn't do it and we still have our two separate, um, two separate subspecies or whatever you call them. I think very soon they will graduate them into full species because they're totally different. These animals are different. I know there are some of them which were taken to Czech Republic many years ago and uh, some researchers are interested in coming back to the country to come and look, study them and look at them again and be able to graduate them into full species. This is something that is ongoing. Next time we shall have uh, uh, somebody concerned from Uganda Order for Authority to give more light on this and what is going on back home there. So we're running out of time. Uh, we, have, we still have only 10 minutes to go. Mr. Ngabirano, and then uh, this is Samsung someone, I think is who? Tumsime maybe. And then we'll have Innocent. Where is Innocent? Innocent Asimwe? No, Bradford is here. Yes, Bradford is here to close this. Martin, please go ahead. Thank you so much, Herbert. Mine is a quick one to those who have been to sites where how often, how easy and how often is it to spot the Debraza monkey? Those who have been to Chibari and those who have been to Semliki, I remember I had a trip of about um, 12 days, but I was in Semliki twice. I was in Chibari for about three nights, but I couldn't. What are the chances of finding the Debraza monkey? Two out of 10. Two out of 10 chances you will say Debraza monkey. But as you know very well, it's sometimes including factors of right time, or the right guide, and your right, uh, right behavior. Sometimes you go there, if you're going for these brother monkeys, you just have to go uh, in, you know, well-dressed, behaving very well, uh, because they are very shy animals. Uh, recently we saw one, we just, it ran away, but we saw it. When we were looking for the, we went to look for the Semliki, Red Colobus, and the Mona monkey, and we had the brother monkey as well. So it's something you can see, but you have to make sure you have small groups, you're not making a noise, and you have the right guide who knows where it is, who has probably seen it previous days. I think you can have that uh, done. Uh, Tumsime Richard, please go ahead. Uh, Sansana Bwana Moderator. Uh, somewhere, somewhere my internet went off, but I didn't, uh, I missed some of the presentation from Uncle Davis. Uh, the presentation that we had, was it only restricted to Uganda? Uh, was it overlapping to uh, the other side of uh, our neighbors in Rwanda? Because uh, the list of the uh, premise pre presented uh, somewhere, you know, like I thought maybe they would cross over the other side of uh, Nyungwe. Um, when you go to Nyungwe, uh, there's a belief. Uh, I don't know how true it is. There are two uh, monkeys, and some people tend to associate two monkeys to be one species. Uh, from uh, there, there is a sun-tailed monkey and the lowest monkey. Uh, I don't know whether Davis has a uh, information about the two uh, uh, monkeys. Okay, Richard, uh, just for, for correction, uh, for correction, we were talking about um, wildlife tourism in Uganda. So they tried to become, you know, like any other natural guy, nature guide, sorry, who would want to talk about the species that may be related to other countries. Like Marcus' discussion was talking about uh, zebras and he brought the whole, you know, whole stuff on, on zebras uh, from the point of, uh, you know, taxonomy up to the, yeah, behavior here down here where they are in different uh, subspecies which he clearly put out 
to differentiate the zebras that we have in this country. So the talk was about uh, uh, wildlife tourism in Uganda, but as any other guide, would just talk about other species. Uh, I uh, don't know whether Davis has... Do you want to say uh, something? Uh, I'm running out of time. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, do, does the... Uh, Davis has a, a, a photo of uh, uh, the, the, the another species of uh, um, uh, rabbit monkey uh, that we share with the uh, northern part of Uganda and the north sea western part of Uganda. The photo, yes, I have actually. I have plenty picture of, of that those. monkey. I have plenty of those, but I think we have run out of We have. I have them. I have those photos. I will share with them. Uh, in the next presentation, a reminder please, to come and give them. I have them, I can give you a comparison as you look at them. I have so, photos okay. of the tantalus monkeys and photos of the uh, velvet monkeys, and you can look at them and they're really totally different. Yes, um, so ladies and gentlemen. Can, can I help him uh, with the sun-tailed monkey? Quick, quick, please, one minute. Okay, so this is the sun-tailed monkey from uh, run that, uh, as you can see here, if, if you look at the tail, it has an, an orange tip, the tail, which is not the case for the uh, Lahoist Lo Lo monkey that we have in Uganda. Also, if you look at the back, this brown is extensive. It goes all the way to the sides of the animal, which does not happen with the Lahoist monkey. The Lahoist monkey, the brown only extends to the back, only just around here. It does not go further than this. So yeah, that's what I can look at as some of the differences between the sun-tailed and the Lahoist monkey. Because the okay, distributed is the same species. But just yeah, because of the different so the they changed it to different yeah. uh, species. Yes. Well, I'm not sure that they are, <laughs> they are the same, uh, but... Um, the same. It used to be one species, that's what they say, but just because of the uh, lifty valley process, you know, during that effect, you know, a separation of different uh, ecosystem created two different species. That's what other books say, you know. That's why I was saying, uh, uh, Uncle Davis, if he has, a, he has more information about that. But since maybe time is getting off, maybe we can share that information next time when we get time. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very much. We will definitely look at that. Uh, but from what Davis presented, and uh, if you if you if you looked at that photograph of the of the host monkey, they are totally different ones. Today. They cannot be the same. Yeah, very. They look very, very, they look very different. different. Yeah, they yeah? are different. Yes. yes. You look at this one. Do they look the same? Look. No, they are not the same. Different. Very good. They are not the same, but they say it used to be one species. Just that's the, okay. They are not the same, of course, by looking. You know. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Richard. And therefore, I would want to request uh, Mr. Bradford to make it, you know, just to say thanks to these people who have been here. And this is a, a part of the family. And guys, remember to put your email on the chat room because uh, at the end of the day, you're going to tell us would be interested in looking, knowing who was here. And also uh, to let you know that this discussion has been presented, on, it has been live on YouTube. You might go late on YouTube and look for. Uh, this presentation and uh, and uh, maybe if you came in late you're able to get what was discussed before mr bradford with closing remarks you're welcome uh, thank you so 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 much moderator from where i am i, I think i'm really really so happy that uh, uh, the initiative has been taken in very very well and uh, there's no better way really to wind up on a, a beautiful week like this week as we go to uh, 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 next week, where we have 14 February, I think uh, I want to wish all of you a very, very good uh, weekend. Uh, the, uh, to me, I think there's a lot of uh, takeaways from here. Uh, as I said earlier on, you can never, never stop learning. And I like uh, the presentation from Davis and Mark, where often for lack of knowledge or information, you can conclude so that when you get more information, then you put a disclaimer. I think to me, that is really the way to go. Uh, let's not uh, think uh, we are experts in wherever we are. Uh, you can see that uh, 
more information is coming that if you cross over uh, to the, in, in the neighborhood, then of course you get uh, more additional information. I think let's get open. Uh, and then it's only then that we can actually learn faster and better. Of course, this should be done also within the context of the, the EAC, within the context of Africa. Because I, as I read from the moderators, is the African Institute of Tourism and uh, and all the field guiding. So you can see it's a big thing, outside bigger than Uganda in a way. So which means we uh, actually need to be uh, bigger, look at Africa, look at East Africa as a destination, but above all, we need to distinguish ourselves. We need to have visitors that come here and then before visitors come, definitely we need to be prepared. So that said, uh, for this year, uh, uh, destination to be competitive, I can assure you without information, we're just wasting. Without good guiding, we're wasting. Wherever, without good accommodation facilities, we waste time. Yeah, without, you know, when visitors come, they must be happy. They spend money, they spend money, even if they're NGOs and they want to have an extension excursion to the field, they spend money. This time it will be their own money. So they need to have value for money. I think this is where we need to move from. And let's not stop here. Let's continue to research, research, expand our knowledge of frontiers. This is the only way you can competitively or you can engage uh, visitors, you can engage uh, researchers, you can engage uh, fellow stakeholders within the industry. And really, I want to thank uh, our moderator every time product knowledge, product knowledge. It's now that I have realized that product knowledge is really, this is the middle thing. If you don't have product knowledge, I can assure you there is just nothing you are, you, are, you are selling, there's nothing you are promoting, there's nothing you are leading anybody to. So uh, I, uh, in a nutshell, let's know our destination. Let's know it very, very well. Even in terms of distance from where I am to say Liki, uh, what is the what is what is the, what is the, what's the distance? Yeah, what's the distance to Semeliki? That helps me in planning. Within Semeliki, what time do I arrive there? How long does it take me to look for some of these permits? Yeah, yeah. if it is a minimum of four hours, it should be as such. You know, and it should be a good uh, estimate so that uh, when visitors come and get out, even stakeholders, they know I think we are on top of our game. So again, uh, moderator, let's not stop here. To me, this is just the beginning. This is the beginning. Let's continue to unpack and unpack and unpack. Let's reach out. I can assure you, we have a lot of many things that we don't know. Uh, still the moderator, I think it, it was in Kidepo. Uh, and and he, he, he was able to cite again another animal that the, I think people thought they were not here, yeah, and he was able to see. So again, this is just because we are interested in some of these things. As UTB, uh, you are our important stakeholders. For us, really, as a government institution, we don't own any of these uh, products. For us, we are just like uh, spinners. We talk, 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 talk. But you can only talk loud and clear when we have our stakeholders with us. So let's let's work together really. To me, that is what I promise. I, as UTB, we promise to work with you. And without you, okay, there's no UTB. There's no UTB, there's no information, there's no nothing. And you know how, how big we are. Our, our substrength is really, you know, you can count your fingers plus one, and that is actually UTB. Oh, your 10 fingers, that's, that's UTB. So how do you expect us to be in 100 and you know, last time I counted the number of districts, I think there were just too many. How do you expect us to be there? So again, uh, Mr. Biranga, I think uh, I cannot thank you more than now. Let's just move forward and we look forward to another engagement. Shouldn't be long, should be the last one. And let's really, next time I think can be budding, can be anything and where they are and we should be able really to make our destination complete. I thank you and I wish you very good weekend. Thank you so much. Yes, thank you very much, Bradford, uh, that with those uh, encouraging words, and I can assure you that you are very determined. Next time we shall invite people like David Vakaine, uh, we should have a discussion on rhinos, because these rhinos are a very special uh, thing, in, a special attraction in the country, and we shall be inviting those experts to come and ex 
you know, give more details, more information about conservation, about tourism and behavior of these animals and this distribution of these animals so that our guides, our tour operators be able to learn and get more information about the things that we sell. It's very, very important that we all know about what we are talking about, what we are selling. Very important to know our distribution, the distribution of these animals, plants, uh, birds, primates, you know, other animals, rodents, all these things, snakes. We have got young women now who talk about primates, all the, I mean, reptiles all the time. They'll be coming in this discussion and be able to share the knowledge. It's just something we need to do as a country and make sure that we get something, I mean, we sell what we know very well. With product knowledge, we'll never go wrong. I want to thank everybody who has been here with us for keeping time and, of course, spending your data on this. Maybe it's a learning thing, of course, something we can always do and interact without any borders, share the knowledge. And we shall be announcing very soon the next topics so that people can also go and do some research on their own so to make the discussion very lively. You know, when you ask questions, when you have also done your research, when someone has done his research, and someone knows, you know, it, in doing that, then we all learn and we come back, we go back home with a very rich uh, mind. Thank you very much. I wish you a very pleasant weekend. Rakeni, I'm coming to see the white crested turaco there. And the, of course, I would love now that you are there, I will come with my cameras and take nice photos of the rhinos in very good angles. Congratulations. Thank you very much. I wish everybody a nice weekend. Bye bye.